we cordially invite our chief guest, T.V. Mohandas Spicer, chairperson of the board of Manipal Global Education Services Private Limited. He is also the co-founder of RN Capital, which aids funds for operational support to various companies across industries. He is also a recipient of several awards, titles, and memberships. He received the Padma Shri Award from the President of India in the year 2015. Now, I request him to join us on the stage for delivering the special key address for the topic, Project Management, Powering India's Global Leadership. Uh, folks, thank you, first of all, for inviting me. My association with project management goes back a long way. When uh, we started a chapter in Bangalore, I think 15 years ago, some of you might know that, with Gul Iqbal and a very senior officer from IBM. We had a rudimentary office, then we started getting people. Then at Infosys, we made sure we had one of the largest number of PMPs certified because we felt there's a very critical function. The only area where possibly we were not successful those days was to work with government. Now, when Sunita asked me to come, I said, I'm going to speak about the macro picture, because you guys understand projects. Projects aggregate into an enterprise, and enterprises aggregate into society. So I want to talk about the societal changes that are happening today. I believe we are in the age of disruption and the next 15 years are going to radically change the way we live all around the world. It's already happening in some parts of the world, and it's going to impact us in India too, in a significantly great way. It's happening in various areas across industries, and the cumulative impact of that will be much more than the impact that happened 200 years ago when somebody invented the steam engine. Before the invention of steam engine, civilizations were built on human muscle and animal power. So India and China were the largest economies in the world. The steam engine was invented and came off patent in the United Kingdom. And that led to the Industrial Revolution. And in 200 years, the world changed. For 3,000 years, the center of power was Asia. Then it shifted to Europe. And Europe dominated the world, blew itself up in two great wars, where about 70 million people were killed leading to a change in the order. And now, in the next 15 years, because of economic growth, because of many things else, the economic order in the world is getting reversed again, led by technology, led by demographics, and led by globalization. So globalization is bringing the world together. Technology is creating platforms to change. And then demographic change, the aging of societies, particularly in the West, is creating another impetus for societies to dramatically change. Japan's population is declining dramatically, is aging. 25% of Japan is above the, age of 60, above the age of 65. Russia's population is declined. Scandinavia has declined. America is growing at only 1%. And China's population grew only 0.5% in the last 10 years. And people fear that China may become the Chinese have become older before they're richer. So these three things are acting together to change the way societies are. And this is going to impact the way we live all around the world. Now let's take some of the industries to understand the impact. Oil. The world consumes 92 million barrels of oil every single day. About 32 million barrels is produced in the Middle East, in the OPEC countries. Now, America had banned the export of oil in the United States in 1971 after the oil crisis. In the last year, the Obama administration, Obama reversed the ban because of fracking. The Americans discovered fracking. By fracking, you drill horizontally, and then you drill, uh, um, you know, or you drill vertically down, and then go horizontally and tap into small pools of gas and uh, oil trapped in the rocks. And you take the oil out, and America's production grew from 2 million barrels a day to 9 million barrels leading to the price decline in the oil market from $145 to about $55 today. And this single change in technology has made sure that oil, oil production expands, is easily available, and the decline in oil prices has led to a decline in the industry value from $6 trillion to $4 trillion, giving $2 trillion to very large sections of consumers. Consumer surplus has increased. 
But it implies that for the next 15 years, fracking as a means of taking oil of the ground because of technological changes is going to keep the oil prices quite steady. But oil prices keeping steady implies that the geopolitical situation in the world changes. What happens if the oil income in, the, in Saudi Arabia comes down? Saudi Arabia has been running deficits at 20% of GDP. Their, their money hoard of $750 billion has come to $500 billion in the last three years. And because of this instability that's happening in the Middle East, we're seeing political repercussions. And the instability is also being led by other areas in the consumption of energy. Look at the energy markets. I think in the month of July, for the first time in 200 years, the electrical power in the United Kingdom all came from alternate energy and not coal. Coal was the prime source of energy for 200 years, but 100% of the energy was created by alternate energy for the first time. In Germany, 35 to 40% of the energy today is alternate energy. So solar energy and wind energy is changing the, oil, changing the energy dynamics in the major economies. In the United States for the last three years, analysts have put a cell on the utility industry because the utilities are now under threat as solar alternate energy is becoming a larger part. And people say by 2030, 30% of all energy consumed in the world is going to be alternate energy led by solar and led by wind. And if that happens and the price comes down, especially because of Chinese manufacturing, you can imagine the impact that will have on national grids all around the world and on coal. President Trump came to power saying that he's going to give jobs to the coal miners in the United States. The coal miners are not going to get the jobs because all coal companies' production is indeed coming down. Imagine a world where you have a solar panel on your house, you create solar energy at 18%, efficiency could go to 25%, the energy is stored in batteries, lithium-ion batteries on your wall, and then that source of energy becomes the energy for lighting and heating your house, in the cold countries for the whole month. And then you have a car which plugs into the solar energy, stored in the batteries, and the car becomes a mobile source of power. And in the night, you can drop power from the car into your house, and all for almost free. Then what happens to all the grids? What happens to peaking power? 60% of all uh, grid, and, uh, grid, grid capacity is peaking power in the major economies. So we're seeing the oil market getting disrupted. We are seeing the energy market getting disrupted. And in the energy market, we are seeing the rise of the electric car. The electric car has 20 moving parts. The IC engine has 2,000 moving parts. The electric car only costs $1,500 a year to run in the United States because Tesla is the dominant producer, the supplier, and about a, a, a IC engine costs about $10,500. So if you have a car which is run on alternate energy, particularly solar, and you have a car, which is an electric car, then the entire IC, um, you know, IC industry all around the world, internal combustion industry all around the world will go for a six. And it's happening right before our eyes right now. Two weeks ago, I went to the Tesla factory in the valley. And let me tell you, it's quite amazing. It's an amazing piece of engineering because the entire car has been developed ground up, designed ground up. It's a piece of software with a mechanical cover, and they have a train uh, to drive the car, which is so small, an electric engine driven to the train, which is so small, and which is so efficient that the cost dynamics change dramatically, and you can go for about 300 miles without a recharge. And for most people in the world, 300 miles a day is just about the maximum that they can do. And to that, the autonomous car is also coming into play. An autonomous car is a car that drives by itself. We went to the Google campus, we saw an autonomous car, we saw that Tesla's autonomous car is all a piece of software. You download software, and the software takes care of changes in the car. And every time the car goes, signals and IoT devices in the car with radar finds out how the car interacts with traffic, and the data is fed into the back into the cloud, and being in the cloud, the data is analyzed, and then you have AI algorithms to make the car much more smarter. So you could have a situation where on the mobile you caught a car, the car comes, picks you up, you tell the car where to go, and it drops you, and the car goes away and comes when you want. So you're seeing the oil industry getting disrupted, you're seeing the energy industry getting disrupted and having dramatic changes. 
and you're seeing the automobile industry getting disrupted again. The automobile industry is worth $2 trillion. 90 million cars were sold last year. And by 2030, about 60 to 65% of all cars are going to be electric cars. And if electric cars come, if autonomous cars come, what happened to insurance companies? 400,000 people die in accidents. That's going to come down. People are not going to own cars. People are going to share cars. What happened to all the jobs? Jobs, people. We don't know, right? All those drivers. India has some 20 million drivers. What happens to all those drivers? So we're going to see a dramatic shift in three large industries. In the oil industry, where consumption could come down because 50% of oil is consumed by the automobile industry. We could see it in the energy industry, where you could have alternate energy coming up with cost coming down. In India, the grid cost for solar is lesser than the coal cost already because of large scale manufacturing. Then you could see a change in the automobile industry because the cost dynamics change. And you could see a change in the automobile industry because of autonomous cars. And all of them come together, then you're going to see a dramatic change in three large industries which possibly employ 25 to 30 percent of people all around the world. Look at manufacturing. Today, 3% of worldwide manufacturing is coming through 3D printing machines. What are 3D printing machines? They're additive manufacturing as against routine manufacturing. In an earlier era, you went and mined, and mined a piece of ore and then made into a metal, made into a part, and that means you took the metal and carved it out and made into a part. In additive manufacturing, 3D printing, you design something, component on the PC, and the PC and the machine in the 3D printing prints it out layer by layer, up to 30 microns. So you can get a 3D image of a part, create the part instantaneously. Today you have large production lines. We know industry 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, now we come to 4.0, right? So you have plants which are uh, centralized, where design is made, the parts are created by many people, they all come together, they're assembled in the place. Imagine a world where you can sit and design a car in Bangalore, you are in somewhere in London, you want a car, a bespoke car, the design is made, it comes to you electronically in the, to the cloud, and then you press a button, the neighboring shop, the car is printed out for you. We have had 3D printing of aero engines, 3D printing of rocket engines, 3D houses being printed, and we had body parts like skulls, parts of the skull being printed, we had designer limbs being printed for people who want a hip transplant, and today in Bangalore, parts of the liver are being printed. Blood vessels are being printed. Chocolates are being printed. So all this kind of additive manufacturing is disrupting manufacturing itself. And if manufacturing is disrupted, what happened to supply chain? Today, the world is linked together by a supply chain. Manufacturing is in China, and the supply chains are run in China because the manufacturing has to go from the mines all the way to somewhere where the parts are made, the parts are assembled, and they come back. Now, if parts are done by metal powder or plastic powder, and it can be done right next to you, what happens to the entire supply chain which has been created? And adding to that, we have factories which are getting automated because of digitization and robotics. In the Tesla factory, 80% of manufacturing is by robots. And the robots work 24 into 7, seven days a week. They don't ask for a raise. <laughs> in the Foxconn big, big complex, in China, it appears two years ago, all these poor girls who came from villages, who worked 12 hours a day, stay in the hostel, and work six days a week for a decent wage, actually asked for a raise. They had the audacity to ask for a raise. And the management started replacing 50,000 of them with 50,000 robots every single year. And they say in three years' time, 50% of production will be done by robots. Why? Robots have now got the capacity to be dexterous. The robots need to know how the human hand works because we've got dexterity in our hands, right? Our motor nerves work very well, right? And we can do many things. But the robot cannot do it because it's very difficult. The algorithms don't work. But robots have now been created where even electronic assembly can be done by these robots. A friend of mine went to China to a very large factory, one kilometer in depth, half a kilometer wide. It was dark. She so asked them, is the factory closed? He said, no. He said, there are no people working, there are no lights. Oh, they're all robots. The entire production line is robots. Production comes out to the, to the delivery side, shifted onto lorries, and the lorries go autonomously, as it happened in Germany, 
where they went 1,500 kilometers, you could get it delivered to the warehouse, and once it comes to the warehouse, the robots will take it and put it into the stacks, you see it in Amazon right now, and stack it properly, and they know where to go. It's actually happening in a pretty big way. I read an article two days ago, we said a Chinese entrepreneur set up a garment manufacturing plant in the United States, which can make a T-shirt for 34 cents a piece, fully automated. Fully automated. And China is producing a million robots every single year. When the Chinese get their act together, the world changes. Because they can do mass manufacturing. They can do it at lower cost than anybody else. And in China this year, a million electronic vehicles could be sold. So maybe by uh, 2030, maybe you know, out of 90 million vehicles, there could be 60 million vehicles, which could be electronic. You will not need that kind of vehicles, because the electronic vehicle can go for 200,000 kilometers without any repair. There are less parts to repair. Repair costs come down. And people say the car is only used 5 to 10% by everybody. The rest of it is parking, right? So you don't need a car. You need transportation. And 10% of Los Angeles is parking. You use for parking. So the cars go round and round, they waste fuel. You may not need all that because of the sharing economy. You see what happens to Ola, Uber, because you all share cars, right? Many of you, you are young, were saying, we don't need this car, we can always have a Uber. We can have a Ola and take the car and go wherever we want. On the weekend, we can take this. So you're having this disruption in the auto industry, in the oil industry, in the energy markets, and in manufacturing. And big changes are coming in the life science industry too. What is the most important asset each one of us has our life. Our life is finite. Everybody passes away, 70, 80, 90. The average long liberty for a human being today is 77 years around the globe. In Japan, women live up to 88, men live up to 85. Men die earlier than women. Women are going to outlive everybody, so you've got to treat them well. <laughs> so, life is the most important asset you have. Now, how do you elongate life? People say a child born today will live up to 100 in the United States. Why is that? Most diseases have been conquered. You've got DNA-based medicine, where a piece of a DNA are taken and custom-built medicine is done. Because the typical medicine is a chemical compound, and for 30% of human beings, it doesn't work. So you can take a piece of DNA and check it up, do some kind of test, and give you a particular medicine. And that can be solved. Right? You can do stem cell research to regenerate body organs. A large part of the body is getting regenerated by stem cell research, right? Then you, people are finding ways to reverse, uh, you know, cancer. What is cancer? Cancer is the growth of unregulated cells in your body. When cells in your body grow in an unregulated manner, they kill the good cells and you die. So now they're trying to see how to trigger the good cells to fight the bad cells to stop this unregulated growth. Because then you can find out what triggers the cells to grow in an unregulated manner. Similarly, you can find out how to trigger the good cells to fight, right? And then, aging. How do you age? From the age of 30 onwards, it appears the body does not regenerate the same number of cells as it does in the first 30 years. There's a slow decline. And that's why you found it out that when Dravid went to Australia some three, four years ago, he was bowled between bat and pad four times in the series. Because when you bat to somebody who's bowling 145 kilometers, is the eye, hand, and leg coordination that works. But if eyesight dims a little bit, the eye, hand, and leg coordination, there's a little bit of a slip, and you get bored. The hand doesn't move, the eye doesn't move, your legs don't move. That's why I saw Sachin in the last test trying to cut on the outside and give a catch to slip. You saw Kapil there bowling in his last days, coming and bowling fast, but he was just floating the ball. Why? Because we age after 30, and the cells don't regenerate, right? It's a slow decline for some people, faster decline for some people. Now the research is going on to find out what triggers the changes in your cell which makes them regenerate lesser. And if you can delay it to 50, it means that the process of aging itself gets, gets delayed. And all this happening because of big data, because of simulation. There are six superbugs in the world Bugs which are there in the hospitals, which kill people for which there's no cure. For the last 35 years, there's been no antibiotic to cure these superbugs. In Bangalore, a company called uh, Bugworks has done computer simulations, created models to find out a cure for five of the superbugs. And they just got a $6.75 million grant from the UN organization to carry on the research, to do clinical trials, and they're very confident it can be done.
a human being because I simulated a human body, a simulated attack by a virus, and the, what happens when it changes, and says if you put a drug to tear the walls apart of the virus and destroy it, how it will work. And it's been done because of unlimited capacity in IT and big data analytics. By using big data analytics, you can find out patterns and you can find out answers for that. So in life sciences working, and the ultimate brain research, how does the brain work? 82, 82 billion neurons in the mind, right? Emotion is a chemical reaction in the mind. Love, hatred, anger, frustration, they're all chemical reactions in the mind. The memory is stored in billions of neurons which work at 20 watts. Somebody told me the other day that the brain consumes only 20 watts of power. It's fantastic. No computer consumes that kind of power. Maybe it'll come to it in another 20 years, but the brain consumes only 20 watts of power, and there are 82 million, billion neurons which connect to each other rapidly, and this connection leads to memory, storage of memory, and recall, uh, and everything else, right? Now, they're trying to find out how does the brain work. The brain works by weak electrical impulses. By finding out those weak electrical impulses, you can manipulate weak pulses to go inside and manipulate the brain. They worked on a rat to find out, can you put signals into the brain of the rat to make the muzzle switch? It actually worked. And people are pouring money because everybody wants to control how the brain works. It's a very complex, complicated piece of architecture and machinery in place, which is natural. So life sciences are focused on elongating the life, but it's going to be expensive. It means the rich will live longer, the poor will die. Can you really think about it? Well, well, well. Just become rich, all right? So you're seeing life sciences. You're seeing, in, uh, you're seeing uh, changes, disruption happening in financial services. For the last 400 years, banking was, you took deposits, lent money, three, three, and three. Took at three, three percent, lent at six percent, made a three percent spread, and went home at three o'clock. Now, the payment system, which kept this architecture, and which is regulated, is now getting disrupted. The payment system is getting disrupted by mobile transfers. That means today you can get a loan in about 30 minutes because all your data can be taken from the web and put together, a credit score can be generated, and you apply, you get a money, and the money is transferred electronically. You can transfer money through the mobile in India through UPI for almost no cost. You can do investments, you can do um, transactions, the stock exchange, you can buy and sell uh, you know, fixed income, you can do whatever you want. So what the bank does is getting deconstructed in very different ways, and many, many organizations are coming up to tackle this problem. Remittances from outside, is uh, cost is coming down. Why is that? Because people are creating pools of capital in various places and trading that and electronically transferring to the bank system because the payment system architecture is quite well developed. On top of that, if you have blockchain technology where it does away with the need for a centralized ledger where there is security, then the entire system gets disrupted. What does the bank do? The bank creates a ledger. It maintains your accounts. It gives you debits and credits, right? But it belongs to the bank. So you have to go to the bank. Now, by blockchain and by authorization, you know, you control the entire system. You don't need a bank. You can transact with various different banks. And the India stack developed in India through ADA, through JAM, through the UPI, through the consent layer, EKYC, is playing a role in disruption. So financial services are getting disrupted. And then there are $8 trillion of government bonds at negative interest rates. $8 trillion, zero interest rates, or less. And because the surplus of money, Interest rates are low. People are borrowing this money, putting into work to isolate innovation. Innovation cycles for 36 months, they come to 18 months. So more and more money is going into startups, into young companies to change. Because the pace of change is becoming extremely rapid. And in that, OK, five minutes, I'll finish. In that, you're finding another big change. Another big change, which is even more dangerous, that's IT. Huge capacity available in the crowd for free. Artificial intelligence algorithm to find patterns, big data analytics to find out various patterns, all coming together so that what human beings do can be eliminated to a great extent. There are three kinds of jobs human beings do. One job is the creative and the logical part where the left brain and the right brain works, like an architect, a software designer, software architect, etc. Second is jobs which people like hairdressers, masseurs do, which are individualistic. And the third is jobs which are done by people which are rule-based, like you said, uh, all these great things that project managers do, right? 
you know, look at all the project management, uh, put, you know, algorithms, and then check what to do. It can be done by a machine. A large part can be done by a machine. It's data gathering, advanced planning, and execution, and instructions, right? Now, the second kind of job a 60% of human beings are engaged in is slowly coming down. In India, in the last 15 years, about uh, the banking system has grown 8 to 10 times in assets and liabilities, employment grew 5%. In the last 15 years in America, 15 million jobs have been eliminated. And middle class income has not risen at all. So all this is happening in a tremendous way because of IT, because of huge capacity. In this thing, what should we do? We should have leadership by thought to tackle this, leadership by action, and leadership by outcome. Leadership by thought is to understand what is happening, understand all these facts, sir, assimilate them, and come out with a new strategy for enterprise and redesign the enterprise to meet the strategy. The old heavy enterprises can no longer do. You have got to be flexible and move. Leadership by action. Use the strategy, use this strategy to create an action plan and work out the action plan. And with the new architectural design of the enterprise, make sure you actually meet competitive forces, which are going to be very global. And if you make long-term investments, you're dead because you won't have time to record the investment. Leadership. Uh, you know, and, and by, so, so now we've got leadership by thought, leadership by outcome. What should be the outcome? Right? The outcome has to be positive to everybody. If the outcome is positive to one section of society, then you're going to be in trouble because there's going to be social action. Now, people are saying that in future, if people don't have jobs, you've got to give them what is called basic income. The government will give every human being a certain amount of money every month to leave because they're not going to be good jobs. And it's already happened in Switzerland when they had a referendum but only 23% of people voted for it because the rest said the Syrians are going to come and take it away. They didn't vote. Elon Musk, Bill Gates have gone on record to say, we must put social security taxes on robots and use the money to give people. And what will people do? Well, people will have entertainment, people will have virtual reality and augmented reality, put all the screens and live happily in a different world for eight hours a day, put a tube in the mouth and sit like a coach potato or do whatever it is. I'd go dancing, I'd do whatever it is. I don't know. But the big danger is all the skills we got in the last 400 years, the skills that we got are going to go. If human beings don't have the skills, the skills of work, the skills of execution, the skills of conceptualization, what are you going to do? So this kind of deception is coming in society, and we have to face for that. To face for that, we require leadership. The leadership has to be leadership by thought, where we understand and assimilate. It has to be leadership by action. We come out with plans, and we are rapid, and we are flexible, and we meet that. And it has to be leadership by outcome, because the outcome has to be positive. If the 1% of the world becomes richer, the rest don't, get, don't, don't have the basic income, then you're going to have a social reaction, and the 1% are not going to raise easy. So my friends, in the age of disruption, which you're entering right now, and we are in the midst of, and which is accelerating, all of you as project managers have to rethink have to rework and find out what is happening and reorient your strategies, reorient your enterprises to compete in this new challenge. And India may be 10 years behind. We have 10 years to make up because by the time technology comes, we are a demand-constrained country, but it's already happening in various parts of the world. Thank you very much. That is the loudest and the best applaud that we've got. Thank you, sir, for the empowering speech. Highlighting the theme of the PMI National Conference India 2017. Sir, if you can please uh, excuse, yeah. Please kindly stay back on the stage, sir. So as a sign of our gratitude, we would like to present you a memento. May I request Mr. Mark Dixon, the chair of the PMI Board of Directors, to please do the honors. Thank you, sir.